Okay, let me begin by thanking the organizers to invite me to felicitate uh, Don. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure. And I was a bit hesitant because the last few years my interests have decidedly become more physical, far from the austere world of modular forms. Uh, but there is a beautiful connection that we discovered in the course of our uh, collaboration with Don. And I thought it would be a good idea to present. Uh, I realize also that it's a very broad audience, including some six-year-old and some other younger man. <laughs> so I will try to uh, present a, a kind of a overall perspective about the field and what are the interesting open problems, and some of the things that I'm beginning to rethink again. But also, another temptation was that felicitation also offers an opportunity for a roast. So that was also very tempting. So I will begin. <laughs> so I will begin with that pleasant task first, for the first few minutes. So, so I first met Don. Actually, how do I move this? So my first encounter with Don was uh, through his uh, classic book uh, of Hitler <coughs> on Jacobi farms. And actually, Boris Piolin and I, we had organized a workshop in uh, Paris in 2007. Boris is also here in the audience. And we had invited a number of mathematicians just on a hunch, because somehow the interaction was beginning to get important. So actually, Gritsenko, who's also in the audience, Feingold, and Maxim Konsevich, we invited. Along with Don, and in fact, Maxim reported his work on wall crossing uh, conservative urban paper at that conference. So it turned out to be actually a fruitful workshop because also our collaboration there we started uh, during this workshop. And the main reason is that the counting function of black holes is often <coughs> a meromorphic Jacobi form. Sorry, this is the word. Is there a USB stick in, in that thing? I mean, then you should put it in the in the monitor at the top. Is there a switch? At the bottom. At the bottom, sorry. I know there isn't a Is there a switch on the Where right is side? Is there a switch on the side? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Okay, nice work. So, the black hole counting function, which I will explain what it is a little bit later is often a meromorphic Jacobi form, f tau of z with poles in z, in the elliptic variable z. And then dinner conversation about the poles picked our interest. I mean, so these poles were kind of bothering me. Uh, I was thinking about them. And Don explained that the meromorphy implied a loss of modularity of the theta coefficients in this expansion of this function. And apparently, this relates to some century-old problem going back to Ramanujan. And his former thesis student had understood how to restore the modularity uh, at the expense of holomorphy and the connection with Ramanujan smock modular from, from a century ago. So of course, for Don, uh, the modular is kind of a given thing. I mean, if you give him a, people say that physicists think when they think about a chicken, they say that, okay, let's assume that the chicken is spherical. <laughs> <laughs> and then they add the head and the tail and so on. I think in case of Don, if you gave him a chicken, he would say that the chicken is modular. <laughs> <laughs> but for physicists, the modularity in this case had actually had a very deep physical reason that has to do with holography. And uh, it implied that modular symmetry was part of global diffeomorphism. So there is actually geometric torus in this problem, which is not evident. And it's the mapping class group of this geometric torus, which is the set to z, which is what is implicated in this uh, modular symmetry. And therefore, in a geometric theory, it simply cannot be violated. So this really bothered me, and this was what puzzled me. This loss of modularity was very puzzling for me. And so then Samir Murthy, my colleague who was a postdoc at the time in Paris, we figured that, OK, sorry, I'm uh, getting ahead of myself. So we thought that it would be a good idea to collaborate with Don. Uh, and maybe in a few 
months we'll figure this, few weeks or few months we will figure this out. <laughs> and also I knew that uh, John had quite famous uh, collaborators. So I was of course familiar with Eichler and Zagier. There was Gross and Zagier. Apparently he had also collaborated in his uh, <laughs> 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 So I thought collaboration would be a good idea. <laughs> and uh, it was also fascinating that the black hole physics had connections with this mysterious mathematics uh, about, of Ramanujan I had heard about in grad school. There was this beautiful lecture of Dyson I had heard. And uh, uh, I was therefore an, an inspirational figure for everybody from India. Uh, so I thought it would be a good idea and with his help, you know, after all it's just a poll, we'll hack our way through and we'll figure it out in a few weeks. Uh, but Samin and I had no idea what we were getting into. <laughs> because this, as anybody who has collaborated with Don knows, that no paper gets done in a few weeks. In fact, those of you who are familiar with the socialist economies, like <laughs> <laughs> Soviet Union or uh, India, you know, you have a five-year plan. You know, the budget is presented for the five-year plan. So this was our first five-year plan, <laughs> 2007-2012. It was actually very worked out very well in that this long five years and many late night discussions over good wine in Parisian restaurants, this led to a very nice paper, 150-page paper, the quantum black holes and mock multiple forms. And then, then we have the second five-year plan, which is about to end. Uh, and the, the plan is to have an expanded version written as a book in Cambridge Monograph and Mathematical Physics. And Don, we have, we have to do something about this. <laughs> I wrote a letter to Samir only yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> only a few months remain to fulfill our promises. So uh, the thing is that uh, in the course of this uh, uh, work, I, I was kind of reminded of this. Uh, Dyson has this has classified mathematicians into two classes: you know, birds and frogs. Uh, the birds are the ones. So frogs is not meant as a as a pejorative. He himself puts himself in the category of frogs. So birds are the ones who really like the universals and they don't understand like some big picture and they are not interested in the details. And the famous example would be like Rotendi, who thought 57 was a prime number. There's a big story about him, which is called a Rotendi prime. So they are not interested in the details of some particular prime. And then the frogs are somebody like Ramanujan. For him, some uniqueness of a number like 1729 is really important. And I think, and there are some, of course, like Euler who fall in, or in both categories. There is no sharp distinction. But I think Don, I would say, probably in the frog category. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I realized that uh, he is no ordinary frog. <laughs> he is like a frog extraordinaire. <laughs> <laughs> and it really suited because physicists are also a bit like frogs in that they really wanted uh, concrete answers and it was really fun, therefore, to collaborate with him. But in the process, you know, even for a Philistine physicist like me, I really got an appreciation of the beauty of mathematics. For example, some things that I learned from him are sort of a glimpse in a mind such as Ramanujan's. I think uh, Zagir, uh, John also works in a similar way. Like one thing that I learned from him is that if you know the first few Fourier coefficients of a modular form, you basically know it because it's finitely generated. <coughs> but if you secretly know some modularity of the objects involved, you can prove all kinds of mysterious and magical identities. And I could see, you know, of course, uh, Ramanujan did all these expansions on a slate. Nowadays, you can do with Pari. You can go up to 100 digits. But uh, it sort of gave me a glimpse of how things work. Uh, <coughs> then, you know, in the old times when all <coughs> sailors used to be men, it was said that uh, a sailor has a woman in every port. Uh, likewise, Don also has an apartment in every country. <laughs> so of course in Bonn, but I have been to his apartment in Utrecht. Uh, in Trieste, he recently bought a new apartment. Then I have been to his, his charming apartment just behind the Notre Dame uh, in Paris. And our collaboration would start like this. I would go there in the morning on some Sundays. And then it would, be, it would start with an accomplished uh, piano concert. Uh, then we would work for several hours. And then we would go for lunch somewhere 
in a nice restaurant together with this uh, wonderful wife, Zilke. So I have enjoyed uh, many, their friendship over the years and many, uh, their hospitality and many wonderful uh, moments together. So I would like to thank him for that. And as I got to know him better, I realized that we need this exterior of an intense and brilliant mathematician lies an intense and precautious MIT undergrad. Because, <laughs> because my collaborations really reminded me of my undergraduate years. The one particular one I remember is, in fact, it was in Bonn. We started to work before dinner. Then we worked here in the institute. Then, OK, we went over to dinner. Then we worked at the dinner over wine. Then Don said, OK, I will walk you over to your hotel. It was a, so then uh, we walked to the hotel. Then there was a bar. So we started to work in the hotel. So it was like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, <laughs> 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. <laughs> uh, we were still working. Actually, the correct thing to say is that Don was still working. From that <laughs> 1 o'clock, my concentration was fading. It was 2 o'clock. And then after that, Don was satisfied with whatever it is that he wanted to prove. <laughs> I was also satisfied that I could finally go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but then, just as he was leaving, uh, I, I started to tell him about you know how I was in Korea and how the Korean script is similar to yeah, the Bernard script. And, you know, I also know a few Indian languages, a few European languages. So I shared that interest with him. So I started to show him how the Devanagari script, the Hindi script, is written. Uh, and then he got very really interested. So it went on to 2.30. <laughs> and then after six months, he uh, showed me, he, he wrote me a message in Devanagari. So uh, since he knows Devanagari, I will. Uh, I will wish him a happy birthday. Donji Janmadin Ki Shubhakarnai. Those of you who know Hindi will find that Donji is a particularly respectful and particularly funny construction. <laughs> so happy birthday, John. I don't know why they're celebrating the 65th birthday, because after all, 65 is just a number. <laughs> it's not even a prime. Maybe it's the 17th Fourier coefficient of some particular interesting model. <laughs> John might know. And as they say, 65 is the new 40. So I'm sure that. <laughs> so I wish him uh, many, uh, many years of good health and uh, productive mathematics, and I'm sure he'll continue with the same zest of uh, MIT undergrad for the years to come. OK, so passons aux choses sérieuses, as they say in French. Uh, let me come to the serious part of the talk. So let me start with a, a quote about a book of Manin, and since Manin is associated with him for many years, it's kind of summarizes what I want to say today. So this is actually a quote from uh, a preface by Dyson to the English edition book by Manin called Mathematics as a Metaphor. So incidentally, Dyson puts Manin in the category of words. So Manin sees the future of <coughs> mathematics as an exploration of metaphors that are already visible, but not yet understood. The deepest such metaphor is the similarity in structure between number theory and physics. In both fields, he sees tantalizing glimpses of parallel concepts, symmetries linking the continuous with the discrete. And uh, he looks forward to unification, which he calls the quantization of mathematics. And to complement this, I would say that I will explain to you that the black hole horizon actually somehow knows about the number theory. And mathematicians have come, become used to this kind of interaction with physics. For example, quantum field theory has proved to be very useful. For example, Chern Simon's theory is very useful in understanding not invariance and mirror symmetry. So there have been several places where the quantum field theory has become important. But this is actually qualitatively different, and I think it's, it's, it's quite a deep connection, uh, which has to do with holography and not related to any of the other intersections between mathematics and physics. And I think it's quite interesting and quite new. And it suggests some kind of a quantization of space time geometry. So this is sort of the kind of, uh, if, you, if you would like to say, the big picture, but okay, one doesn't know how far we are from that. So let me now, uh, so this is what I will talk about. And in particular, the symmetry in this case is just the modular symmetry. 
and which relates, for example, the Fourier coefficients of modular forms to some analytic uh, Radomarker type of expansion. So this is one connection where this happens. And in the case of the black hole, the black hole horizon is a very complex, it's a very geometric concept having to do with the differential geometry. And the path integral on the black hole horizon is a complex analytic object. So it's actually very surprising that it knows about an integer, which is a very number theoretic object. And it happens after a step, many steps of, involved steps of very detailed calculations that you see that somehow the complex analytic black hole horizon path integral really knows about a number theoretic discrete integer. And that's the thing that I would like to convey in this talk and how the mock modular form therefore arise on the black hole horizon. So this is the black hole, mock modular forms are everywhere. And you will really see that they, indeed they are there on the black hole horizon. Uh, not exactly on the black holes that have been discovered in, uh, in lab at the moment, but these are some special supersymmetric black holes in string theory. So this is what I'm going to, uh, string theory and M theory, which is what I will now turn to. And to do that, I will have to, uh, Uh, I will I'll move to the blackboard. <coughs> space and some Hamiltonian and related to it is some action principle. For example, <coughs> in the Maxwell theory, the action is the famous Yangman's action, the Maxwell action, or in the Einstein theory, the action could be the curvature uh, Ricci scalar, and so on. And the Hilbert space is a Hilbert space, is just a quantum Hilbert space. So I will come to this action and the Hamiltonian in the second part. So let me first focus on the Hilbert space. And the Hilbert space has some self adjoint operators like the Hamiltonian. And th that self adjoint operator will depend, by theory, you mean specify some particular moduli of this manifold, six-dimensional manifold. So KBO is typically a Calabria threefold. In our case, we will take it to be K3. So I will specialize K3 cross T2 with some moduli, the complex structure moduli in particular. And the, the torus, for example, has some tau modulus. And there are, given such a manifold, I can consider a cycle in the H3 of Kz. And corresponding to it, there is an operator that you can associate with the Hilbert space, which depends on the moduli. So basically, we have operators H mu and gamma mu. So given these two self adjoint operators in this inverse space of M theory, you can uh, find out their eigenvalues. 
we depend on mu and the state, this gamma. And gamma also depends on, its eigenvalue depends on mu and gamma. It's a bad notation. <coughs> Let me call this gamma. What is it? M is the energy eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian, which in this case, if the particle is sitting at rest, if you think of a, so this is R3, comma 1. And the state that I'm considering is, think of it as like a particle sitting at rest in the plane, and therefore with some mass M. So if I, if I have the Hamiltonian acting on it, since its energy is M, the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian is M. But in addition, it has some charges, gamma, which depend. And at each point in the space, there is a k cross S1. And the radius of the S1 is r. <coughs> and there are two uh, limits in which we will consider. One is the limit when r is much bigger than 1. And the other is the limit when r is much less than 1. And the descriptions actually simplify considerably in these two limits. In this limit, the same particle sort of gets basically Newton's constant becomes large. So Newton's gravitational constant is related to this r. So basically, there are two pictures of in the two different limits. In one limit, you can basically treat it as a point particle, really like a point particle. And gamma is some complicated cycle. As you can see, since gamma belongs to H3, Kz, it could be some complicated cycle, and physicists call it the brain wrapping some cycle. So for example, around the torus, it could wrap n times around the A cycle and m times around the B cycle. And similarly, inside the K3, it can wrap so many times around some particular cycle of K3. It's a very complicated cycle in this. But that cycle alone is not enough. You have all kinds of interactions happening at the intersection points, which determines the dynamics of this object. The simplest example of such a cycle, for example, is related to, for example, if you take, so mathematicians, sorry, physicists call this a three brain wrapping this particular three cycle. A simpler example to keep in mind is that if you take a three, and if you take a, what physicists would call a four brain wrapping a K3, and N zero brains bound to it. In the mathematical language, what you should think about is if you have this K3, and there are N points which correspond to the zero brain. So it's a one particular four cycle which wraps the entire K3, and then there are so many zero cycles. However, there is a moduli space because this points can be anywhere on the K3. So the moduli space of this is clearly a symmetric product to the power n of K3. And the quantity of interest for us is that in this Hilbert space, sorry, can you see? In this Hilbert space H, defined by M and gamma, so if I look at the, all the number of states in the, in the Hilbert subspace specified by these eigenvalues M and gamma, I can calculate the dimension of this Hilbert space. I can ask what is the dimension of this Hilbert space. And this I will denote by an integer. This is an integer. It turns out that it's a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So it's an integer that you can calculate. And that counting problem is related to, roughly speaking, all the characters of this manifold. See, it's not the Euler character of some uh, cycle or something like that. It's the Euler character of the manifold of these interacting brains. 
In this case, this is a well-known problem, famous problem. This is related to the Donaldson invariance. And modular forms actually appear in a very natural way in these kinds of counting problems. For example, in this case, the, the, the generating function, if you take the, the order character of m plus 1, then it's going to be something like 1 upon So this 24 is related to the fact that one copy of K3 has Euler character 24. And you calculated the Euler character of M plus 1 symmetric symmetric product of K3. Basically, it's a kind of a simple counting problem, which is given by Q. 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 P, what is P? P is Q. 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 So you can see that a very famous modular form appears in this particularly simple counting problem. So what is M and gamma in the last slide? Uh -huh. So M and gamma, in this case gamma is actually the number of, so gamma is one four cycle and zero, sorry gamma. Gamma is one four cycle and zero, uh, sorry, n zero cycles. That was the cycle that we chose. It turns out that in this case, gamma is independent on the moduli. And so it's just the number uh, n, 2n. So n, sorry. So in this case, gamma is just the number n. And m also turns out to be related to this number n. So actually, in this particular problem, both n and gamma just become simple and they are related to this number. But more generally, in the problem that we are interested in, there is a generalization of this which is called the Donaldson Thomas theory or Pandey Pandey Thomas theory. And these are simi similar invariants of this kind which you can calculate. Okay, so I have explained one part of the problem to you. Namely, we are interested in the Hilbert subspaces of M theory with a particular value of the mass and particular value of the charges. And that leads to a counting problem, which is related to the moduli spaces of some various cycles or some uh, curves and so on. It's some kind of a curve counting problem. And if you can calculate the other characters of uh, more generally elliptic genera of these moduli spaces, what you get is the number that you're interested in. The Fourier coefficients of these objects give you the degeneracies. And these are called quantum degeneracies. I mean, degenerate is simply because it's a degenerate uh, uh, Hilbert space. For a fixed mass, there are many, many states corresponding to that particular state. So it's, uh, it's just a degeneracy in the conventional sense. The eigenvalues are degenerate. So quantum degeneracy is of a particular state with mass m and charge gamma is given by these numbers, d and gamma. OK, is this part clear? Now, if you now crank up your R, and if R becomes much bigger than 1, then you have to use a different description of M theory. Namely, I will check the action. And as I told you, the action is actually, uh, it's an 11 dimensional action. So it's an 11 dimensional volume form. And the action is very similar to the Einstein Hilbert action. If you take the Ricci scalar, and then there is an additional three form field. So the action looks something like this. It's not a very complicated object. And therefore, one can ask what are the solutions of this, which are obtained by a variational principle. <coughs> this action principle, as the physicists call it. And that leads to some equations of motion, like the Einstein equation like r mu nu minus half d mu nu r should be equal to zero, equal to something. 
So this is some non-linear partial differential equation known as the Einstein equation, which simply says that some combination of the Ricci tensor uh, should vanish, or should vanish or should be proportional to some values of this, and so on. And these solutions can be found. Solutions such as, some of the solutions, the particularly interesting solution of this. is the black hole solution. And naively, basically, in the first approximation, number on the left hand side and we continued it we made r much bigger than one so this point like state became like a black hole state and then the question is what happened to this number how do how does that number show up in this picture can you continue along m and gamma so when you take the limit you need to continue on eigen eigen values right yes yes and the gamma integers Ah, no. it's free. You're not giving it. Ah. But the label T is dimension, it's also the screen. Okay. So the point is that uh, you need to continue the one of the modula, namely the R. Ah, you need to continue R, keeping everything else fixed. And the answer to this question is actually very deep and very beautiful and very interesting. And the answer to this question has to do with black hole entropy. And which is why I sort of use this quote of uh, uh, in the beginning about number theory and physics. Uh, the black hole entropy is really the window that gives us this kind of a window into the quantum structure of space time or of this connection between number theory and mathematics. Because so the entropy is a notion that goes back to Boltzmann from the 19th century. 
And one of these really key insights of Boltzmann, which we normally call it S, is S is equal to log of D. Okay? So I can, of course, calculate log of D. Since I have calculated D, I can call it calculate log of D. Question is, how do I calculate S? What, how do I calculate the left-hand side of it? And it's very similar. This is just to give an analogy. For example, in the, this was in the 19th century. It was, I think, 1960 something. Sorry, not 19, 18 something. <laughs> uh, when you could not see atoms, what you could do is the entropy is related, the change in entropy is related to the change in the heat that you add divided by the temperature. So for example, in this room, if you put a heater on, you can calculate how much uh, electricity is consumed and how much heat goes at room temperature. So T is the room temperature and delta Q. And Boltzmann claims that that should calculate the change in this entropy. And by doing this, you can essentially calculate the entropy. Okay, so this is one way to relate the entropy to something really macroscopic. The macroscopic about what is happening in this room, I put a heater on and the room gets heated up. So this is a very deep connection between macrophysics on one side and microphysics on another side. And in our context, this is sort of the connection between uh, geometry and number theory. You could also put maybe general relativity, which has to do with space time geometry and quantum mechanics, which has to do with counting things in a Hilbert space. So, this is why the black hole entropy is such a fundamental object that it gives a connection between general relativity and quantum mechanics which is the big problem in physics is to unify it, to find a quantum theory of gravity. It therefore gives a connection between geometry and number theory. And it's a kind of a uh, microscopic window, so microscopic window into the micro world. And it may be the way uh, Manin's uh, idea of uh, number theory is kind of played out in this particular context. And uh, now I will mention to you one more complication, and I will state that go back to our results. Uh, sorry. <coughs> so how do you calculate this S? S is actually turns out to be the area of the black hole divided by four. <coughs> and what is meant by the area of the black hole? This region that I showed you, what I call a black hole. It's called a black hole because it's actually, this is a surface sitting inside M1, 3, as I told you. But it's a very special surface. It's an S2 cross moving at the speed of light. So it's a bit hard to imagine that each point in the sphere is moving at the speed of light. So what happens is that once you insert the sphere, since you cannot go faster than the speed of light, you can never escape. And that's why it's called a black hole. Once you're inside the sphere, that's why it's called an event horizon. <coughs> so, there is a very beautiful uh, equation by Hawking and Bekenstein that this entropy is equal to the area of this S2, which you can calculate from purely from geometry, <laughs> divided that by four, and that should equal this log of D for large M and absolute value sum. And there is a, okay? So now the problem is that it's clear, should be clear, is that you have a meromorphic Jacobi form on one side. Sorry, I forgot to mention that that in the more general context, the counting function, just like we got 1 upon delta, becomes a meromorphic Jacobi function. And these are the degeneracies, therefore, are given by the coefficients of this meromorphic Jacobi form. Now, one of the puzzles that immediately arises is that 
Not only do you have these solutions, but in fact, you have other solutions which are called multi centered black holes. So, with the same asymptotic data, namely the same behavior at asymptotic infinity, what we'll find when you solve these equations is that we find not only these solutions, but also these solutions. And then the question becomes, should we identify B M gamma with the entropy of a single black hole or with the entropy of the multiple black holes? And this looks like a pesky problem, but it turns out to be actually very important. And that's where actually mock model comes from into picture. So how that happens is very interesting. So the question is that can we separate, given this Merovac and Jacobi form, can we separate the contribution coming from the single centered black holes and the multi centered black holes in some very nice way? And that answer was given by basically, that's one of the main motivations for our paper, was from the physics point of view, was to give an answer to that question. And the answer is actually turns out to be particularly nice and simple. And I will mention. Uh, how much time do I have? Ten minutes? Eight. Huh? Eight. Yeah. Eight. Ten minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. so I told you that gamma gamma was, belongs to H3 of K, K2 for K3 cross T2. Now for a T2 you can choose an A cycle and a B cycle. And therefore, this is isomorphic to two copies of And so, the gamma can be split into what is called a P and a Q, a magnetic charge and an electric charge. This is called a magnetic charge and this is called an electric charge. But mathematically speaking, if you just think of it as one particular way to label these cycles and these cycles. And then this H2 of K3 is well known to be the self-dual even integral Lorentzian lattice. So it has a Lorentzian metric on it. And so it uh, belongs to R. 19 comma 3. 3 comma 19. Sorry, 19 comma 3. So you can define P squared is equal to 2n, Q squared is equal to 2n, and P dot Q is equal to n. And it turns out in this counting problem, the degeneracy basically depends only on M, N, L, and the model. So instead of depending on so many different integers, it actually depends only on three integers. And this is related to a particularly simple, nice Jacobi form, psi M. So N and L are going to appear as the Fourier coefficients of this. That's a very precise connection between the degeneracies and meromorphic Jacobi forms. Now the question, however, arises that the meromorphic Jacobi form I can even write very explicitly is the elliptic genus, again, m plus 1 copies of K3 divided by this Ramanujan function delta times eta to the 6, which is the directed eta function, times the Jacobi theta function. It's a very explicit formula, which you can put on a computer, naively you would think, except for a double quote. And that was the pole that I, I was referring to in the beginning of my talk. So therefore, the naively you could put it, if it was without this factor, you could just put it on a computer and calculate the Fourier coefficients. But with this pole, you have to choose a contour.
But it turns out that the choice of the contour is very nicely correlated with the choice of the degeneracies. So the de dependence of the degeneracies on the choice of the moduli. But that does not answer our question, how do we split this into single-centered plus multi-centered counting functions? And that answer is given by our decomposition theorem. Which says that this Maromachic Jacobic form can be split as a mock Jacobi form plus an upper left sum. And we define this new object for the Mark Jacobi form. Basically, building on the results of Vegas, but it is putting it this way is eliminating also for physical reasons. Uh, <coughs> so it's eliminating many ways. And in particular, the physical interpretation becomes very transparent in this case. So the decomposition theorem says that the only meromorphic of the form, it admits a mero unique uh, decomposition in terms of the form of psi and finite, which has no poles, and an upper log sum, which has the same poles as this function in the complex Z plane. And it is given by this upper log sum, such that uh, each of them admits a modular completion. OK, I am running out of time. But maybe, therefore, I will now switch to the results. And I will quickly run through the results in a in 10 minutes. It's actually the P expansion. In the P expansion, where the one upon the Igusa form it appears, it has this very explicit form. It has double poles, and the Fourier coefficients depend on the contour. And choosing that contour and making sense of the Fourier coefficients is what leads to the mock story. The decomposition theorem says that it can be always decomposed, and it admits a canonical decomposition in this manner. The mock Jacobi form has no poles. The upper log sum looks like this. <coughs> very simple looking. It's basically constructed out of the zeros and with an, some kind of an elliptic average. And the contour depends on the moduli in a very precise way. <coughs> the moduli space splits into chambers in a way that is consistent with duality. And so it gives a very beautiful physical interpretation in terms of black holes. That the, these Fourier coefficients, which are pure numbers coming from number theory, somehow are related to the entropy of the geometric area of these black holes. And in fact, one can go further than that, as I will mention in a moment. So this is the picture in the moduli space. This is in the moduli space. Depending on where you are in the moduli, some places in those regions of the moduli, you only have the single center black holes. In some other regions of the moduli, you have both these solutions are present. The mock Jacobi forms counts the single center black holes, which exist everywhere. The apple Larson counts the multi center black holes. When you cross this wall in the moduli space, it corresponds to changing your contour passing through a pole. And the residue at the pole corresponds to the de jump in the degeneracy, which is the degeneracy of these objects, which disappear going from one side to the other. So it's a very beautiful and nice picture. <coughs> and a very simple physical interpretation of a rather complicated mathematical story. And the, the non-trivial part of this is, of course, the fact that the mock modular forms admit uh, completion. So you can, given the mock modular form, you can add to it something non-holomorphic to make it into fully modular. But that modular object then is not holomorphic. And the holomorphic anomaly is given in terms of this very simple expression in terms of theta functions and theta functions. And basically, in this way, we could get all the known mock modular forms. And in particular, the one that Don likes very much has to do with the generating which of the Hurwitz-Ranecker class <coughs> also appears 
for m m primes, uh, the Mach modulo form that occurs naturally is related to this uh, Mach modulo form that John that uh, Don discovered many years ago, many years before this. So this is the, my last slide on black holes and number theory. That the decomposition theorem is a natural physical interpretation. Part of the story which I have not discussed, which is actually also very interesting, is that the Radha Markov expansion of the Fourier coefficient of the Jacobi forms has a beautiful correspondence with the path integral, which is a complex analytic object on the black hole horizon. And this was the origin of my title. That somehow the path integral evaluated on the black hole horizon reproduces the full Hardy Ramanujan Radha Markov expansion for the Fourier coefficients. Of this, uh, which is a kind of a relation between number theory and analysis, it's analytic number theory. Uh, but here it relates it to a path integral, so it's a kind of by that indirectly it relates us to physics. And for example, the Klusterman sum which appear in the Radomacher expansion arise from some churn sums not invariance in the geometry of the near horizon geometry of the black hole. So this is a very interesting story. This is another story that I have not had time, I was planning to do it. But unfortunately, I am running out of time. Uh, okay, this is actually more general comment that the mock modularity is somehow related to non compactness. So the Jacobi forms arise in physics most naturally as elliptic genera of certain moduli spaces M. So, for example, here I give you an example of the symmetric product of K3. Right? That was the moduli space of four brain, zero brain bound states, or basically the moduli space that is relevant in the Donaldson Thomas story. Now, those modular spaces are compact because K3 is compact. But what if instead of K3, typically such modular spaces are non compact? And one expects, therefore, so therefore I'm saying that this mathematics of Mock Jacobi forms is likely to have much broader applicability and not just in this lack of context because generically, uh, elliptic genera in physics language, that means a conformal field theory, super conformal field theory, are non compact. And so, wherever you, instead of once you relax the condition of non-compactness, the elliptic genera are, remain Jacobi forms, but they are no longer holomorphic. They have some pores. They can have some pores. So the meromorphic Jacobi forms, sorry, sorry, mock, uh, sorry, I said it wrong. The elliptic genera therefore have to be mock Jacobi forms. They do not have pores, but they are mock. So getting a derivation, so I sort of derive the mock Jacobi forms indirectly, starting with a meromorphic Jacobi form. So I think there are a number of very interesting problems which I have been thinking about off and on without making much progress. But is there a physical path integral derivation of the mock Jacobi form in its shadow? Is there a physical derivation of the apple lurk sum in its shadow? The second problem, I think, is probably easier to solve. And is there a direct connection between the attractor geometry and the mock modular form? This is something that I was planning to talk, but I, in view of the time, I will uh, skip it. So I think I'll stop here. Uh, wishing John once again, uh, happy birthday.